Well, hello and a very good afternoon and welcome to all the colleagues joining us today in the first of our Mental Health Awareness Week speaker series, uh, one of two speaker series events being staged this week uh, within Gallagher. And it's great to have so many of you with us. Um, Mental Health uh, has Mental Health Awareness Week is being well supported. I'm sure you'll agree. I think most of us know that it's being held this week. It's been supported both internally here at Galher, but widely across society. There's been a real focus, I think, in media, uh, mainstream media, uh, highlighting mental health and, and, and our approach to it. So I think it's fantastic that Galher is also um, supporting that too. We've been putting together a full schedule of, a, of events and nature-themed activities. Uh, we launched a nature photography competition uh, with colleagues also hosting, I'm told, a virtual walk in nature meditation session and a book club. Uh, as I said, there are two speaker series events happening this week today with Premiership Rugby Club Harlequins and the other takes place on Thursday, a discussion about mental health with uh, Jamie Drummond-Smith, Tom Downey, Ed McKenna, Don Stacey Bradbury and Jane Edwards. Colleagues, of course, have also been opening up about their mental health challenges through our Smash the Stigma campaign. So um, just great to have our guests with us today. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, two of Quinn's finest, um, Scott Baldwin, uh, Welsh hooker, uh, joined Quinn's ahead of the 2019-20 series, signing from Ospreys, where he made more than 120 appearances. Scott uh, scored in his Harlequins debut against Gloucester in the Premiership Cup. I don't know why I mentioned that as a Gloucester fan. I don't think I should have mentioned it, but there we go. He did score against Gloucester uh, on his Quinn's debut, and it's great to have Scott with us. And we are also joined by Will Evans, who joined uh, Quinn's from Leicester Tigers for the 2019-20 season. He played for four England age group squads Squads, including the under 20s. Oh, that's my son trying to call me. Who he helped reach the final of the World Championship, where he was named in the uh, competition dream team. That was the under 20s. Um, so it's great to have Will with us as well. Welcome to both of you. We were hoping to also be joined by Joe Merchant, uh, Quinn Centre. However, Joe has had some technical issues, and let's be honest, we've all had a few of those over the course of the last few months. So we will forgive um, Joe his absence, but it's great to have Scott and Will with us. Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing to address, I think, within rugby, um, mental health and our awareness of, of our own mental health and how openly I think uh, people now feel much more comfortable talking within a sporting environment, within a rugby environment, about how they're doing and some of the challenges they feel. And I know that Scott and Will are very happy to talk uh, about their own experiences. I think it's really important to make clear none of us have any training or any... Um, qualifications in, in mental health or medical matters at all. However, all three of us have got life experience, and I think that's the whole point of of what we're trying to do, which is smashing the stigma and talking openly about our, our experiences. Um, and I know, um, Scott, if maybe start with you, that that Joe Marler, your, your teammate at Quinn's, has also been very open and uh, honest about his own challenges. He's, he's struggled with depression uh, and has found it really helpful to be supported by the club. And I think mental health sits really at the centre of Quinn's. I think the way that they have addressed it and approached this maybe is, is, is leading in the way that uh, Premiership clubs have been able to, to really focus on this and give the support to players that they need. Yeah, definitely. It's something to be fair. Um, I was in, in place before I came to the club, obviously, with Joe and his background and so on. Um, but it's something Paul Gustard brought in with um, Craig White. We had um, trust people so players could speak freely and openly and coaches um, about our experiences, what we've been through and so on. Um, and I think that's really brought us together as a group and understand each other on a deeper level than just saying in the mornings, hi, how are you? And just giving the, yeah, I'm OK, thanks, you. Um, answers. But yeah, it's been brilliant. Um, and the support they gave me last year when I came out about my gambling addiction was phenomenal. Um, from the playing group, the management, the board, and so on. Um, and they've been really supportive in that. And it's something before I'd done the interview, I was really nervous about because I didn't know how it would come across. Would it be perceived as that could affect my job? Um, that was probably my biggest worry, but it's been the best thing I've ever done in terms of uh, speaking out, just taking a weight off my shoulders and also made others uh, around me aware um, that if they've got issues, the best thing to do is to talk about it. And this this concept of trust circles, uh, Will, is such a, you know, it's such a 
bold move for, for Queen's, but it, it just allows people to talk very freely uh, about any emotional concerns they've got. And, it, and it, it has had quite an effect, hasn't it, within the, the club and within the squad? 100%. When we started getting around in a circle and um, just having a chat, really, it's, it was kind of embarrassing um, when you said when you come in on a Monday and be like, oh, "I'm not not quite there with you today, lads. I've had a bit of a rubbish weekend." It's, it was quite embarrassing at the start, but the more sessions we did, the more we learned to talk completely freely with each other, and um, they were such valu valuable sessions. I think the past um, couple of months, and uh, you know, obviously, given that we were all locked in a global pandemic and not able to have the contact with loved ones maybe that, that we would have needed and, and feeling quite isolated at times, it, you know, it's, it, it has been so important. We've talked to many of the different clubs about how they've supported their players through this time, supported their people more generally within the club. It's something that's been very much at the, the forefront of what Gallagher have been doing as well over the course of the last 18 months. Uh, Will, a word on you though, um, you know, not only uh, have you been Sort of coping with lockdown and, and all that that entails, but you broke your leg last month uh, in that match against London Irish, which you know was so brutal and I'm so, you know it was bad, you know difficult to watch and, and so sorry to, to to see you basically right off the rest of the season. How are things with you at the minute? Um, they are difficult as as they probably should be. I mean, I'm on crutches. Um, uh, it's difficult carrying your own food around the house and hopping around is not particularly nice. Um, and that knowing there's some really massive games coming up, hopefully a, a semi-final and potentially a final for Quinns, that I won't be play any further part in it, um, which is horrible knowing that you've played the whole season to get to this point and you won't be able to finish it. Um, but now I'm looking forward, looking forward to next season, hopefully um, becoming fit for the first game of the season. So fingers crossed. And you've given yourself a real focus there. Maybe we've had a little chat in a, in a while about just how you reset your focus when, when something like this happens and the support that you've received from the club, because it is tough. And, and, you know, it's tough just getting on with it. As you've just said, you know, living on crutches is not easy, but also just knowing that what you want to do desperately is is just not possible. So we'll, we'll come back to that. But I want to go back to Scott, because you mentioned the interview you did last year. And for those that maybe aren't aware of Scott, um, apart from being an outstanding athlete and a tremendous um, rugby player, a great hooker, he, he came out very honestly last year and, and talked about his problems with gambling and, and online gambling. Um, and maybe, Scott, you can just give us a little bit of background about that and how you came to share that and, and, and the, the effect of sharing that. had. You, you mentioned that it, it, it was something of a weight off your shoulders, but of it, before you were able to take that step, you must have been living under a significant strain yeah it was it was a struggle i was i probably realized i was addicted when i was uh, in the 2015 world cup in the in the training camps um i tried to it and deal with it on my own um and looking back now i remember the morning of the quarter final we were just about to leave and i was i was on my phone gambling 10 minutes before we leave leaving for a World Cup quarter-final because I, at the time, in the moment, I felt like it was helping me, distract me from what I was about to go and do. Um, but now looking back, I was consumed by it. Um, I remember my wife saying to me, because I never really said anything to her, I told her I had a bit of a problem, but I don't think she really um, understood how bad it was. And there was a point where she thought I was cheating on her because I was turning my phone away and we were sitting on the sofa watching telly um, just on, online gambling and when I went to do the interview something um, I know a couple of younger boys uh, who I've played with um, who I won't mention obviously have been through some really bad times um, and I'm very fortunate I've got a great support ne network around me um, so obviously I told my wife um, about it and we, we kept it between us really my wife and myself um, one of my close mates now um, and then Gareth Riso in the on the BBC Scrum Five podcast asked me, uh, would I be willing to do an interview? Um, and I asked my wife, and we debated it because her family never had a clue about it. My mum knew a little bit, um, so I agreed I was going to do it. Um, but I didn't think I would, didn't plan to be as honest as I was. 
But then when I sat down with Gareth and we started talking, it naturally started to come out. And I, I felt a massive burden off my shoulders because as much as my wife knew I had done it, I don't think she knew how much it had been consuming me and how much I held what I had done in the past in my present moment. I mean, I remember after the interview, I was so honest. And I, got, I finished the interview and I thought, my father-in-law doesn't have a clue about this. And he's like a father to me. Um, so I phoned my wife said, look, I need to speak to your dad. And I thought this is going to go down really bad. Um, he's going to disown me. And he listened to the podcast and he was like, mate, I'm so proud of you. Um, and I had a lot of players message me, ones that are struggling, ones that have struggled in the past, ones that spoke to their parents or their loved ones after hearing the interview, realising they're not the only ones that have been through it. Um, and for me... I could kind of finally lay that to rest because it was out there. Everyone knew what I'd been through. Um, there was no shadows, no stone unturned. So I could literally move on with my life. And since that day, I've been like a new man. I know it's, it's easy to say, but um, it's been completely life-changing for me and for my family. My wife said instantly the change she's seen in me, which has been brilliant and something if I hadn't have spoken out about it, I think I'd still be consumed by it. And it was incredibly, as, as your um, father-in-law said, very brave of you to come out and, and, and talk so openly about it. And, and I think, you, as you say, you, you surprised yourself maybe about just how um, open you were and how honest you were, because it, it, it was tough, wasn't it, Scott? I mean, you it, you got yourself into some pretty dark times with it, and, and, and it, it's just fantastic to see the way that you've been able to come through it. Yeah, I think it's been brilliant. Like, again, talking about Joe earlier, I remember the day, day and I come after, he came after me, gave me a massive hug and said, I had no idea, mate. Um, and it was little moments like that, the boys coming up and just being so supportive um, really helped me. And that's something since I've come to Harlequins, I've realised massively how open the club is to different people and everyone has different characters and not to be pigeonholed. Um which is something probably in my head I, I had perceived before, which wasn't the attitude of another club or anything. But, um, yeah, it's been brilliant. And, uh, like I say, I'm a new man now in some ways. <laughs> and, and Will, I have to say, it, everything that Scott's saying does have a familiar ring to it because, you know, I've heard other players, players in, at Bath who were able to, to talk openly about periods of depression with their mates, say that they've been seeking help, Say, saying that you know they, they valued the support of the players around them, and, and in some ways, you know, maybe we underestimate the people around us, and and the fear of opening up and sharing how we're feeling is actually worse than than when you find the courage to go through with it and, and actually start being much more open and honest. Because we we have to have a little bit more faith in the people around us because everybody has some some tough times, and I think. The great thing, I suppose, about this whole um, mental health awareness, not just this week, but generally, I think, the, you know, we are much more open now and we are talking more about it. Do you think that that, that perhaps we have had l less faith in the people around us and that we're sometimes pleasantly surprised to find actually the depth of their empathy once we start talking to people? I think it's so hard to do, but we have to remember people, people care. People who are close to you, teammates, family members... They only want the best for you. They care so, so much about you. Um, and for you to bottle it up and not talk to anyone about it um, is only doing yourself a disservice because there is so much help out there. There's so much, so many people talking about it nowadays. The money, the funding that is getting put into things like this, um, it's only going to help people not bottle it up. And eventually when they do talk, they realise that, People really, really care about you, and um, must be must be really nice. As Scott said, once he got it off his shoulders and spoke to the guys at the BBC, um, there was straight away an outpouring of family members who just wanted to look after him, and it's something we forget quite often. And I think in this sort of age of of professionalism, Scott, you know, there is that sense of you know players come and go you don't live your whole time in the same um group you're not it's not as though you've come up through a community group uh you know from minis and 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 lived in the same and played for the same team all your your career you move around so you're you're meeting new guys all the time uh, 
and just being confident enough to believe that those around you have got your back. Now, I think that's something that is peculiar to rugby because it is such a confrontational sport that you really do rely on your teammates to some extent, Scott. And I, I, I'm also interested in how you think maybe it's changed and our perception of it has changed over the last so, even five years. Well, yeah, it's, it's something, again, I've noticed uh, from having different characters. I probably come through at the tail end of the dark ages um, of rugby um, in the early 2010 when you were pretty much told what to do and you do it, you don't have an opinion. Um, if, if you've got an injury, you just keep it quiet, don't say anything. Whereas now it's a lot more um, accepting if, if something is wrong and it's okay not to be okay. Because um, in the past, I, I, personally, I wouldn't have said I struggled a little bit with depression a few years ago. I never would have come out about it because I would have felt that it would have affected selection. They could use it against you and so on. And that's something, again, with the trust circles, you found out, um, like Will said, it was awkward at start, but there'd be a common theme. Boys would put up and coaches would all have the same insecurities, the same bad weekends, whether it's your little one, little thing like your little one not sleeping or stresses with money or work or anything like that. Um, you're all, there's a lot of people in the same place and everyone has different, there's different, different situations, but everyone has the stresses and the worries. Um, and again, that is something which really helped me to be, feel like I was normal, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And I think... <laughs> You know, I touched on it before, rugby being such, I don't want to use the word macho because it's not the right word to use, but it's a, it's a physical, confrontational um, sport, both when women play and when men play. You know, you're dominating the opposition. We talk about collisions. We talk about, you know, dominating and overpowering and aggression and all those things. And it, it seems like an interesting juxtaposition to be talking about our feelings and to sit and talk about our emotional well-being. But, but actually... And well, in my mind, if you are, have the strength to talk about your and confidence to talk about how you're doing, how you're phys emotionally doing, as well as your physical state, that says an awful lot about you. I think it, sh it shows that you're, one, comfortable with who, who you are and what you're trying to do, but also it shows that you feel as though you've got the support of those people around you. A hundred percent. And um, I think what's really important is having a, a good healthy environment where you get to know your teammates really well. Um, I think it empowers you to to show your feelings a bit more, whereas if you don't quite know your teammates or uh, your work colleagues around you, it's probably less chance of you opening up to them. So I think a healthy environment really empowers people to speak out. Yeah, exactly. And also recognising the, the signals that would maybe tell you if one of your teammates is, is going through a tough time. I think Joe is... I'm, I'm, Crossing my fingers here, I think Joe might have been able to join us. Joe uh, Merchant, Merchant is, is I think, dialing in. Joe, are you on the line? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Sorry for the. Um, yeah, sorry for not being able to connect. Don't worry. Great to have you with us, Joe. Joe um, has been with Quinns ooh, since 2014-15. Uh, made 80 appearances for the club, so uh, uh, he's a great servant to, to Quinns uh, and a great teammate to Scott uh, and. Uh, and Will, and we've just been talking, um, Joe, about the, the support network within Quinns, and I think more widely in rugby generally, and I know PRL and uh, work hard to support players, as do the professional bodies that, that work with players as well. But I just wondered if you had any first-hand experience yourself, either personally or or, or, or having experienced issues or indeed pr helped provide support to a colleague. Um. Oh, I've, um, yeah, I've been at the club a while, um, and yeah, there's been throughout the whole time I've been there. Really, there's been a lot of changes, a lot of uh, new faces and new people come in. So, not necessarily there's been particular, um, you know, um, circumstances, but definitely new players coming in and making them feel comfortable, making them um, feel like it's an environment where um, you know people can speak. I think it's been one of the most um, important thing over the years really i just listened to the last bit that that um that webby said and it was just uh about like boys playing well when they you know when they feel like themselves when they feel like they know the players around them and and, and the environment's good 
Um, and I think that's just, yeah, something that's always been uh, a massive charm, uh, focus for me to make sure that everyone else around me is all good so I can be as well. I think so. It's just having that kind of responsibility to one another. Um, and we've been talking about trust circles and, and how important that was when, when Paul Gustard brought that in uh, to Quinns. And, and I think it's replicated across across the league, to be to be honest. I think it's something that, that we the other players would certainly identify with. And Will, I wanted to ask you about the, the, the sort of added burden of, of trying to come through a long-term injury, um, which is, is tough because obviously a lot of the time you're, you will eventually you'll get into a rehab situation where you'll be working really hard to get yourself fit and ready for next season. But how do you refocus the mind and, and really keep yourself um, centred when you obviously are so bitterly disappointed to see the season end this way and, and to, to have suffered such a, well, major injury. Oh, Will? I can't hear Will. Sorry. The pop. <laughs> yeah, technology. That's Sorry. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, very, I'm very segregated from the squad at the moment. Um, purely because I'll be doing my rehab. I won't be out on the pitch with, with the lads. Um, so it's very tough, but you've got to give yourself a goal and a purpose for the, the rest of the squad. Um, how can I affect the squad? Not on, Clearly not on the field, but maybe some are watching the game at the weekend and the, the person who plays in my position, um, Jack Kenningham, who's a young seven, how can I give him advice? It's all about how can I improve the team, even though I'm not going to be on the pitch. Yeah, and uh, listen, we, the, the nature of the last 18 months has, uh, has meant a lot of us have been isolated from our friends and our colleagues and people who we would normally turn to to give us that level of support. Uh, w um, Joe, I was going to ask you, what, what kind of practical measures did you have at, at uh, Quinn's to keep you all connected in that early stage where you weren't able to form bubbles and come and train together and communicate? How did you manage to, to make sure that, that you were all OK and that you were all in touch and, and supporting one another? Um, I think mainly through Zoom um, was one of the big ones. Um, I actually wasn't here. I was actually in New Zealand at the time when it first broke out. Um, and yeah, like all, all the boys and stuff were um, were on a lot of zooms, and um, yeah, Guzzy was um, I think Guzzy was the one kind of driving that a bit. Um, so I was actually um, I just got back into training really um, with the club I was playing for out there because obviously COVID wasn't um, wasn't too much of an issue over there. But yeah, just even just getting back into contact with the lads and, and seeing how everyone is, um, you know, just just making sure that you know all the all the things that you try and do, like, you know, social meet up, those kind of things, you just try and get all those things as close to, um, you know, realistic as possible. So then when it moved into the phases of, you know, we're returning back and I've actually come back from New Zealand, um, like training and after training, just doing all you can within the, within the restrictions, obviously, to, you know, to, to keep that social element up. And I think it's massively obvious um, within the Premiership, the teams which have been able to do that the most, who have been the most um, connecting over all this time, of the ones who have come out on top. Um, because, I mean, you know your players better, um, you know each other, and, and yeah, I think you, you play better when you know each other better. No, that's so true. And I think to, to remain connected, and uh, to have each other's backs, just to make sure that you know nobody's being left behind or... I think also trying to identify when maybe somebody is having a, a tougher week than others and, and being sure, making sure that they've got the, the support that they need. Uh, a couple of questions have come in. Uh, I shall just quickly have a look. Uh, one is actually from a colleague saying, it's good to see men being able to open up. Women always seem to do it more easily. I think some women do, uh, and it's true. I think maybe it has been a... Uh, it's taken a bit longer for men to, to realise that you know, it's 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 all it's okay sometimes not to be okay and to talk about what that feels like. And there's been some amazing work done in Australia, particularly. Uh, I've got a friend who works with a charity there who's worked really hard in the um, Australian rules community, Aussie rules community, to try and get people to to open up and be a little bit more, um, I don't know, support mutually supportive, but also feel confident that they can talk about emotional issues without it 
being seen as some kind of weakness. Uh, and another question was, and I don't know if you guys will be able to help us with this one. Um, could you shed any more information on the upcoming documentary, Big Boys Don't Cry? So this is Joe Marler, isn't it? I, I don't know if Scott or, or Will or Joe, any of you, any insight? And we're looking forward to seeing um, Joe's programme. But Scott, have you had any insider knowledge as to what we might expect? Um, I think he goes uh, very early morning in minus degrees in the water. Um, but yeah, he hasn't given too much away. He's he done, I think, the final edits uh, uh, start of last week, he said. Um, he didn't actually tell any of us he was doing it until said, what do you do on the weekend? And he was able to the document. Um, and then obviously explained a little bit about it. But um no, I think it's brilliant what Joe's doing um, to, again, uh, help get rid of the stigma around mental health, um, which is great. And I think uh, knowing Joe will be very entertaining as well as insightful. Oh, definitely. I can, <laughs> I'm can. i quite sure, but I think it will be really insightful. And one of the points he made in the newspaper interview this week um Will was he thought maybe a psychiatrist would be a good idea to have to take on the Lions tour because it will be a long trip. They will be operating in quite unusual circumstances because they will be in these bubbles and they won't have the usual freedom that you expect from a tour. And they will be all living sort of cheek by jail. And and and, and I understood what he meant by uh, the need maybe to take a psychiatrist because in sport we have lots of sports psychologists, don't we? And we have they're very regularly used to help players get ready for matches, to understand opposition, to understand the the challenges of, of elite sport. But actually, how much of that is, is concentrating on that player's mental well-being? Not really an awful lot. But, I mean, what do you think about that? Do you, is it a good idea to take somebody along uh, if you are on a tour like that and uh, somebody that's specifically focused on just making sure the guy's mental well-being is being addressed and being supported? I think it's definitely worth taking someone um, in that industry. Um, it's not going to help everyone. I mean, if everyone has one session and you get three people out of the 37 that are going who want to use that facility, then you're helping three people and it's been a massive help to, to those three people. So I, I definitely think, and I definitely, and I'd echo Joe's thoughts about bringing someone because it's going to be such a, I mean, they're going to try and build a, as good an atmosphere as possible as they, as they can on tour, but it's going to be really hard when in a COVID environment when people are going to feel lonely and exposed at times. Um, so even if not everyone wants to use that facility, it'll be there for a couple of people who, who really like it and you can't knock that at all. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Steve Peters, the psychiatrist who's worked with a number of elite sports sportsmen and women, including the British cycling team, he works with Ronnie O'Sullivan, um, has had a huge effect on on them. Um, the British cycling team, some of the the real um, sort of leading lights in that team, were a bit sceptical when he first came in, but once they sat down and had conversation with him, really took value from having that level of support. Once they found that they had him there, they were able to talk and, and open up. He was, you know, been fantastically supportive. So uh, I think there has definitely got opportunity to, to, to think about that. Um, Scott is saying that, Scott, you've, you've got experience of um, Warren Gatland. How do you think he, he approaches mental well-being? You know, he, he can, you know, we talk about coming from a different generation, but He's one of the, the, I would say, more enlightened coaches. I think, more, I think to be honest, more coaches today would not be operating at the level of him if you aren't enlightened and unable to adapt and understand the importance of this. But uh, do you find that he's been supportive? Yeah, he's brilliant um, with stuff like that. I remember when we went to New Zealand 2016, my, my wife was pregnant um, and I was battling a bit, being away from home and... He was doing everything he could um, to help me. And then when we come back, obviously we had the baby. I think it was just at the start of the Six Nations. And his his mindset is always family first. Um, and I'm sure it'll be no different on Lions Tour. It was the same going into the World Cup. Um, your family has to come first because, and you, because if your family's happy and you're happy, you get a better version of yourself on the pitch. Um, and I think it's brilliant with Steve Tandy being there as well, who was head coach of the Ospreys. He actually sent me to see a psychologist when I was struggling with a few things. And he's very open-minded in that. And 
just on the sports psychology side of it as well, uh, Rob McBride um, is really, really into that side of it as well and how that can benefit you. He's very philosophical. Um, I don't know Gregor, but I think that's a good thing about that group going away is they've got some uh, some great people there. And in terms of the strength and condition, I know they're taking Paul Stridgen, who again is brilliant for team morale. Um, and I think I think they'll be in a good place. I think it will be tough. Obviously, it's a long, long time away from home, probably longer than anyone would have done in a social bubble um, and something no one's been through before. So I think that's probably why he's picked some of the characters to go and how they will be with the group, uh, both playing and uh, on the coaching staff. Uh, Joe, there's a question come in about pressure, and pressure's a funny word. I always feel a bit odd using it when we talk about um in sporting terms, because it's a, it's one of those questions we always ask pre-match to a, a coach. You know, how are you going to manage? Do you feel under pressure? Is your job under pressure? But it, but it is something that we're all aware of in all in every walk of life. It doesn't matter what you do. At some point in your career, in your everyday life, you will come under some level of pressure. How, what is your coping me- mechanism? Do you ever feel like that? And and what do you what, do? Any sort of, practical ways that you know to help with that that level of pressure um i think um firstly like on the pitch and stuff like you've got to i think you've got to separate the kind of pressure you get on the pitch from from outside pressures like um um you know when you're leading up to a game or whatever um you just got to kind of clear your mind of of everything else really and make sure that you know you're 100 percent doing on the pitch or in the warm up or whatever, you know, what you want is um for the best of the team and, and um you know and and just yeah, just focusing on the game that day. But in terms of actually like managing it, I think sometimes before a game or whatever, just writing down the things which you can control and you can't control I found really useful. Um literally so all it all it has to be is just uh is, is just two little lists and, and once you get rid of the things you can't control I think you can just go into it with a bit of a more of a clear head, a bit of a clear focus on what you actually want to do, little little kind of things you want to focus on, and then you can, you know, make positive impacts on those little individual things. That's a very good point, actually. I, I always say that don't you, you know, don't worry about things that you can't control, uh, and it certainly makes sense. Uh, Will, would you echo that? Is that something you when you've been talking about big, high pressurized situations where you try and break it down, like like Joe said? Hundred percent. That that would be so. Uh, twenty four hours before before a game, twelve hours before a game. I think there's a lot of pressure if you're not playing so well at the time, um, and you come off the pitch and you're you're pretty drained and you're not happy with your performance. I think that's when the pressure, or well, for the pressure for me, that's where I found it to be quite uncomfortable. Um, but speaking to teammates, I think about how to um, improve performance where you can uh, adjust your game a little bit um, is vital because you don't want to be sleeping or before you're about to go to sleep in bed, closing your eyes, thinking, oh, I'm playing terribly at the moment. That's the pressure for me. Everyone can deal, most people, I think 90% of people in professional rugby can deal with the pressure before the game. I think it's when you're out of form, um, that's when it starts to turn pretty nasty. Mm. Yeah, and that's where, that's where you're looking for the support network around you to really step in and, and, and help you through that period. Um, Scott, w- would you agree? Yeah, definitely. And again, I think it's something we're really good at at the club. Um, Food boys had a tip in form over the last eighteen months, it's up and down, up and down. Myself included. I, I can vividly remember we played London Irish, and I think uh, we had lost four lineups on the bounce. Um, and I think I looked at. Stefan Levis, our captain, and he wanted to take three points because obviously it wasn't going well. And just in that moment, he backed us to go to the corner, which my head probably dropped a little bit. But him having the confidence in me, knowing my personality, um, really helped me get back to myself. Um, and we all have those dark moments, myself included, um, going into games like Will said. And I think that's that's a massive part of it. Um, and that's something which... Um, I think gets lost a little bit um, and something which is getting better, but I think a lot a lot of uh, clubs and a lot of people can help with that. I think it's just self-doubt, isn't it? Sometimes it, those doubts creep in and you and you concern yourself about your performance and what your, your contribution in it, and it can spiral, uh, you know, unless you are 
supported and 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 it sounds as though they've got you know, some really good people in at Quinn's supporting people and and knowing that dip in form doesn't necessarily mean you know it's it's going to hopefully go the other direction um somebody's asking about time away from the the game and how important that is for your mental well-being so i, I don't know what you fellas get up to I, when when you're not playing rugby and not training or probably not as much as you used to since we're not allowed to do an awful lot but things are slowly changing but generally speaking what what kind of things do you find help do you you know we, we, we're trying to do things within Gallagher we look at involving nature that seems to help you know a lot of people find a lot of calm and wellness through through getting back to nature what kind of things have, have benefited you um let me ask Will that one uh I've it's a it's a tough one because we obviously haven't been allowed to go out and do literally anything for, for a long time um but I, I find getting a couple of teammates and just having a beer I think once <laughs> Once you once you have a few sips, it kind of loosens your lips a bit. And if something really is wrong, then that's probably when you're at your most um, talkative to maybe let it slip and have people comfort you. Um, and as Joe said, it just helps you know your teammates better if if um, you go out for a beer or in the sunshine. And um, I feel that really really helps. Yeah, totally. I I couldn't agree more. A bit of sunshine, I think, lifts everybody and, and just makes you know, I don't know, makes the world seem a bit brighter. Um, Scott, what about you? What what do you do away from the game to to give yourself a break? I think I'm probably pretty similar to you, Joe. With a couple of kids running around, uh, it's pretty full <laughs> on when you come home. But it's it's nice. It's nice to be able to switch off from rugby. It's something I struggled with massively before having kids. Um, I still have a tendency to go turbo at times and overthink things, but yeah, it's, a, it's it's great to just be able to get out and do things with the family, like especially with things opening up now. Uh, being able to take our, our little one who's just turned one and our boy who's four swimming uh, once a week is brilliant, and just seeing the smile on their faces and see how much they're enjoying it um, is fantastic, and it's something I really enjoy doing. It's- yeah, I think once I think we'll all enjoy getting out and about a little bit more. What about you, Joe? What's your uh... What do you do in the downtime? What do you do to get away from it all? Um, I've actually I actually got a dog about yeah nine months ago, so I've been um, I've actually really really enjoyed going for like long dog walks in like some nice woods where it's quite quiet. Um, even like because obviously you're allowed to to go with other people as well. Like um, just sometimes just getting out and just it's nice. Like usually you can't like all the kind of stress of everything else kind of disappear a bit, and especially if you go for a walk with just one other person or whatever. You find that barrier of everything's kind of, you know, it's um, the barriers lift a little bit, a bit like what um, what Will said about, you know, about about the pints and stuff like loosening the lips. But yeah, I think the when you're just getting yourself in that situation, you end up getting a more bit more comfortable with people, and you just end up talking, you know, because there's nothing around. You're just walking through like a nice bit of woods, a nice bit of countryside or whatever, um, and it's yeah, just a really nice way to just relax the brain off, really. I couldn't agree more. I think I've done more walking in the last year than I've done in the last twenty years. So we, we, you know, we, yeah. when, when there was nothing else that we could do, we would just get the, you know, you go stir crazy in the house with the kids. Right, everybody out, let's go for a walk. And it, and you know, it's been great. You have some great conversations, and and you're right, you, it does make you feel as though you're able to open up and and talk a little bit more. There's um, lots of questions coming. One question came in about. Um, you know, once you retire, the support that clubs give to retired players. I think there is more and more being done now, Scott, and I'm not suggesting for a minute any of you three are anywhere near retiring, naturally. But um, I think there is more and more support and there's a recognition that there has to be a little bit more support for players when they when they hang up their boots because it's... I mean, I know from my own experience, you know, my husband was a professional rugby player. He is now a coach, but there was that interim period when he was... He just basically one day you just don't turn up for training and it's it's brutal you know every element of your life has been dictated by being part of a squad and then suddenly it's gone and the life of a professional sportsman comes to a grinding halt um there wasn't a huge amount of support when he uh retired but i think it seems to be improving scott and i think there's been a lot more focus on that hasn't there yeah definitely and i think there's they're really active now, the clubs, in trying to make sure, especially the younger players coming through now, that they do further education. Um, it's something I regret not doing. Um, 
but again, the club um, and the WIU have been really helpful for me. Coaching is what I want to go into. Um, so they're doing everything they can to support me within that. Um, even you know, I'm leaving Quinn's at the end of the season, they're still being really supportive, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I think it's something, especially in professional sport, whatever your sport is, so different to a normal job because the life you, you have to go into a career post-rugby um, whereas normally you'd, you'd finish university degree and then you go into your job for the next 30, 40 years, whereas we probably, uh, I would say, especially from a financial, financial point of view, majority of us will go from earning a significant salary early on in our, in our career, uh, life careers and then you hit 30 to 35 and then you an injury and then you start again. And again, it's a new identity. You've spent the last 15 years, which is more time than you spend in school doing this one career. And all of a sudden, it just within a day, it's, it's gone. No, I agree. I think you're right. There is more being done. And uh, I it's vitally important. I think that exactly right. Having some form of outside interest, whether it's studying or whatever it might be, maybe setting up your own business or all the different things that I see players now doing that sits alongside the rugby has been so important. And we've seen it across all the premiership clubs. You hear guys who, who've been busy looking ahead to the future with different uh, different things that they're trying to do. I don't know how much you guys are involved in Harlequins in the community and some of the, the different um, activities that the club's involved in to support the community. Um, Quinns deliver metal, me, uh, metal to years five to seven in schools. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but this is... Uh, helping uh, young children in school with tools to support the development of their mental resilience, growth mindset, mindfulness, dealing with setbacks, etc. I don't know, Joe, is that something that you've had any involvement in? I actually haven't had that much involvement with it. Um, I've done a bit, fair bit of the RPA with um, uh, with like Open Uni, um, like what Paulus was saying. Um, yeah, that's the kind of route I've really gone down. And like, yeah, I'm in my fourth year of that. And like, uh, yeah, Caroline, who's um, been with the RPA, has really helped. Just kind of just plan a little bit what you want to do, and just you know keep you keep you ticking over with it. Because I mean, if you can carry that on whilst whilst you're playing, um, it just you know like the the, the time you're actually doing it, just yeah, it just it just flies really. And like, yeah, I'm just about to finish my fourth year. I've got two left after, and and then well, hopefully I'll have a degree. So, and and you don't even realise it really. Mm. Fantastic. What's your degree in, Joe? I'm not sure if you mentioned that. I've probably missed it. Oh, it's just uh, sport and exercise science um, on the, in the Open Uni. Um, and, yeah, it's just, uh, like, how old am I now? 24. Yeah, I like, started, I think, in my second year or something, or third year, maybe. Uh, third year out of educa education. And we just wanted to, yeah, just sat down and, like, right, let's actually get doing something. We tried different things, like a carpentry apprenticeship and stuff, and it just wasn't really for me. It wasn't really fitting around the timings. And then, yeah, we just went forward with this. And, um, yeah, I mean, they, sometimes it's, it's tough with that time management around, like, when games are getting busy or, you know, you get, if you get called away with things. But just having something to just keep plodding on with really just actually, you know, keeps your mind a little bit um, switched on to other things, which is actually quite nice. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we wish you well with that. Good for you. It's uh, it's great to see you getting stuck in, and, and and you know you'll reap the benefits. I'm sure you know well down the line whenever you decide to hang up the boots. One of the other um, initiatives from Harlequins in the community is ahead of the game. This is um, something delivered to teenage boys parents and coaches at the club's community clubs to reduce self-harm and suicide in young men by encouraging them to check in with their mates, kids, players, understand the early signs of anxiety and depression. So again, hugely important um, to, mm. to just bring awareness to young, young people at a very formative stage so that it's something that's just part of their toolbox as they move forward through life. And it's something maybe that is much more to the fore now than it was certainly when I was growing up. Um, and will is that? Are you aware of the ahead of ahead of the game? I'm not sure whether it's something the players get involved no, in. I know it's something that certainly the club is involved in. The past, I don't know, six months has been hard because of travel restrictions. We haven't really been allowed to go and do stuff like that. But I'm sure in the next year, especially after um, such a big week on mental health, that players will start 
coming out to these kind of things and um, maybe we'll get a bit more um, publicity, um, which can only be good for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Joe's um, documentary, the, the Joe Marlis documentary, which I think is going to be really enlightening and, and really great way of focusing people's minds on on the importance of mental health awareness, but also on the fact that I think rugby is, is actually leading the way. It's doing a great job at there's no complacency there of course there's still more that can be done but i think it's fantastic that it's being discussed at that level uh, and that everybody's you know that the clubs are doing so much certainly from the signs of things at, at harlequins that's the case and um, scott i just wanted a quick word with you just you know if you were going to give some advice to anybody listening who was perhaps struggling a bit and and, and a bit maybe nervous anxious about sharing those concerns with with those around them you must have had some good learnings over the last uh, last year what, what would you say to them it's never as bad as you think it is you will always think it's worse than it is no matter how bad it is it's never too bad and like will said earlier your support network are there for you everyone wants the best for you regardless of if it's uh it's your boss another employee your family your friends your partner Ultimately, everyone wants the best for you. Um, and I, I, I had a few messages of people who I've never met before, never had anything to do with. But when they said their story, there was a couple of ones which were tough. Um, and even someone that doesn't know them the slightest, I, I tried to be there for them. And I think that's that's like what Will said earlier, people care. Um, but it is hard to to realise when you're in, in consumed by all that um, addiction, whatever whatever you're going through, your mental health struggles, it's never as bad as you think it is. Um, there's a way out. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just to, to talk. I think that is that is the message. Talk to someone, whoever it is. <laughs> it's like Will said, especially when we get out of, out of these restrictions, go to a pub if you want. If you don't want to tell someone that you know, speak, speak to someone you don't. So have a chat about it. Um, there's no harm in it and I think the RPA is brilliant there's a call line for players and it's something I've used over the last two years um, just just to, to vent sometimes is, is, is really good I couldn't agree more and I think when you see somebody like Kyle Sinclair one of the sort of hardest men in rugby opening up and, and sharing how he's feeling and just saying you know this is I've been gutted this week I, you know, he, it was such a I think it's quite powerful when you see something like that. I think it just shows that, you know, it, it's okay sometimes just to, to, to share that raw emotion, to share how you're feeling and, and to talk really openly about, about your emotional well-being. It's, it certainly came through very strongly in Kyle's interview at the weekend. Um, well, listen, I, I, I feel as though, you know, you've been so open, guys. I really appreciate everything that you've been able to share with us today. There's a nice comment here I thought would be a nice thing to end with, which is from one of our colleagues, um, Valentine Singh. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. I'm sure it's been said so many times, but it's very powerful, important and humbling message to get from some of our heroes of our society. Thank you. So that's really lovely from one of our colleagues in Torquay. Um, and I think there's also a nice message from one of your old schoolmates, um, Will. I'll put that onto the message chat for you. So... Um, an old, an old, uh, no, no stories there, I'm afraid. Just a shout out and a hello. Um, but as I said, thanks for, for everything you've shared with us today, all three of you. Joe, and well done for getting on the call because I appreciate that you were having some technical problems. It was good that you could talk to us. Uh, as I said, our mental health working group's been putting together a, a schedule for this week, and there is a second. Um, speaker series event on Thursday. The details are, are online. That would be really interesting as well. Also, we've got resources available to help everyone maintain a good mental well-being. Uh, our mental health pages are a great resource. Your well-being page, again, a great resource. And our colleague assistance programmes. So all of those are available should any of you be able to dip into that. And, and I think this um, conversation that we've had with the guys will also be available if, if you've joined us been able to, to able to identify with what we've been talking about today or indeed maybe one of your colleagues hasn't seen it and didn't join the call you might want to say, tell them that it's worth listening to um, a huge big thanks to everybody at harlequins for making it happen especially to scott to will and to joe really good to talk to you today 
Uh, and listen, stay well, stay fit. I know it's a big match against Leicester at the weekend. Um, so good luck for the rest of the season. I look forward to seeing you uh, in action and I hope forward to seeing you at a pitch at a match one day soon. Uh, and to everybody else for joining us, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.